Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School. This is Lesson 12 for November the 22nd, 2020. We're still in Unit 3 entitled Godly Love Among Believers. And our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is sharing love in truth. Our devotional reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 10, and our background scripture is taken from uh, the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 32, and chapter 5, verse 11. <clears throat> and we'll be studying today from Acts chapter 4, verse 32, uh, through verse 37, and also Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to explore the Jerusalem church practice and witness of communal sharing. Secondly, to regret your idolatrous attachment to material goods. And then thirdly, to create a plan to increase your giving for the common good. We have just two outlines today that will be a part of our lesson. The first outline is entitled, Truthful Sharing. And then our second outline is entitled Counterfeit Sharing. And so we certainly thank and praise God for yet another opportunity to share God's word with you. We encourage you, as always, to prepare your hearts and your minds and gather any materials that you may need. You certainly need your Bible and uh, be prepared to take some some biblical references that we're going to share with you today and I want to just uh, highlight this topic sharing love and truth and I want you to stick a pin in that because we're going to come back and deal with that uh, uh, in a little deeper way uh, but we have quite a bit of ground uh, to cover uh, for this lesson today and we want to uh, give you a thorough account as God would have it and we certainly are praying um, for our country we're praying for uh, our states we're praying for our cities we're praying for our people God's people praying for those who are affected by this virus and uh, we pray that you are being vigilant and adhering to uh, all of the guidelines to keep yourself safe as well as those of your family members uh, during this uh, and certainly through this holiday season. But we want to get to this biblical context uh, that is offered um, uh, from our uh, lesson quarterly. The church at Jerusalem could be uh, designated the church at her best. Uh, I want you to look at Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. Um, it, it gives us a succinct and detailed description of that of the church's character along with the uh, scriptural Christ-centered praying and magnetic church it was a sharing church. Their unity was both spiritual and practical their mutual sharing was not unique in origin but had uh, had been commanded by God when he chose Israel as his own. I also want you to look at Exodus chapter 23 uh, verses 10 and 11 the book of Leviticus chapter 19 verses 9 and 10 Leviticus chapter 23 uh, verse 22 and then the book of Deuteronomy uh, chapter um, 24 verses 19 through 22. I just want to give you a little uh, background of the book of Acts itself. Uh, the book shows uh, the progress of Christianity uh, from uh, Jerusalem to all Judea and to Samaria and to the end of the earth. You'll see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So this commission of the risen Lord had already been introduced by Luke in his gospel. Uh, I want you to look at Luke chapter 24 uh, verses 46 through 49. And so here it is again described and traced out uh, 
it's uh, outworking as a result of the advent of the Spirit. Secondly, uh, the book continues the acts of the risen Lord through the Holy Spirit. So in the first account, uh, the Gospel of Luke, Luke says he uh, dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. You'll see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 1. So uh, in the Acts, uh, Luke describes what Jesus continued to do and teach through his body, uh, the church, uh, uh, brought into existence at Pentecost. That'll, you'll find that in Acts chapter 2 and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So this um, activity of the risen Christ in heaven working through the Holy Spirit on earth suggests the name uh, the acts of the risen Christ or the acts of the Holy Spirit rather than uh, merely the acts of the apostles who are only human agents. And that's key for our lesson today because as we get into this sharing of these uh, believers, I want us to understand that uh, none of us can claim credit or, or, or a glory in the things that we do. And I want to make that clear because as the text, uh, Acts chapter 4, will outline, I, I also want to uh, insert this, this, this phrase of prior to. Uh, because uh, prior to the uh, sharing that we're going to look at in Acts uh, chapter 4, uh, you will recall uh, Peter and John had been arrested uh, and they had been uh, uh, literally forbidden to preach the name of Jesus. Uh, all of this you'll find in Acts chapter 4, but what is consistent uh, in this account in this narrative here uh, following uh, the arrest and release and the uh, commandment not to preach in Jesus name uh, Peter and John continued uh, what they had been commanded to do uh, and if you look at verse 23 of Acts chapter 4 and I just want to touch on this because this is key to our understanding the text that we're going to uh, share with you today. So verse 23 of Acts chapter 4 says, And being let go, uh, Peter and John, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God with one uh, accord, and it goes on to talk about what they pray, but they reference the uh, the Old Testament or the Psalms, if you will, Psalm two, uh, particularly. But so, what is unique about what these individual believers were engaged in? Number one uh, was the message. The message is key uh, when we read about uh, uh, this account that they had all things in common or as we just read to you uh, uh, they uh, all of these individuals the chief priests and the elders had said to them the Bible says so when this is in verse 24 so when they had heard that they raised their voice to God with one account what does that mean so so they they were in sync if you will about the messaging uh, or, or the prayer that they were going to pray. They were in sync about the messages, uh, the message they were preaching, which was the name of Jesus and all that associate with that uh, bringing salvation to individuals and the like who had not yet been saved. And then also uh, uh, they had the same boldness. And this is what the prayer is centered around in verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. It was a prayer for boldness and as a result of this oneness of message this oneness of boldness this oneness of prayer God moved uh, and so uh, as we look at uh, verse 29 I'm still in Acts chapter 4 we're going to move quickly to the text but I want to lay this foundation uh, 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 about 
what's happening in, in as we lead into the sharing. Verse 29 of Acts chapter 4 says, Now, Lord, this is still part of the prayer. Uh, uh, look on their threats and grant to your servants with all boldness that they may speak your word. This is the message we were talking about. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Look at verse 31, Acts chapter 4. Uh, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bible, I want you to underline that because uh, this unity is not because of the gathering so much of the believers, of the physical but it has everything to do with the spiritual. And so as we look at verse 31, as a result of this oneness of message, oneness of prayer boldness uh, 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 in the prayer itself, that something happened. God reacted to this prayer. Uh, unity is key when we want God to respond. And so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 31 says, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That is what they asked for. So well, let's get right into uh, this 32nd verse of Acts chapter 4. And this is our first outline, Truthful Sharing. And so now that we have the tone set that God had responded with the Holy Spirit on all the believers, we can conclude now that they are working now from the premise of the Trinitarian teachings uh, 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 and we learned early on uh, as we remarked about uh, this was not the act quote unquote of the apostles but it also helps us to understand that these were the acts of the Holy Spirit and so we don't want to forget that because if, if we do then we will start to credit the individuals for what they gave uh, and that is notable what they gave but the glory goes to God. Let's just make that clear. So as we get into this first outline, Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 37, I want to read this from the NIV translation. So all the believers were one in heart and mind. So now we know how they got there. Uh, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Uh, verse 34, and there were, that there were no needy persons among them, from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them uh, and brought the money from the sales uh, and put it at the apostles' feet. Uh, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles feet so this is equivalent what is happening here is these individuals have the right spirit uh, they have the right spirit because they have been given the spirit of God they have been given the Holy Spirit who is able to uh, 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 move us in a way move our hearts convict our hearts that we do not just the right thing, but the righteous thing. Uh, you notice that all of these individuals had a giving heart like Christ. He gave of himself. And so now they have this spirit followed by this prayer uh, that God obviously heard. And, and, and not only did they receive this prayer request, uh, you notice if you look at the the, the uh the, the, the account of this prayer, uh, nothing was asked of God for themselves. They were not asking God for houses, cars, and the like. Uh, they were not asking God uh, for tangible things. What they wanted was the message, the boldness to continue to, 
to spread the message of Jesus Christ, even though they had been arrested, right, and they were released, they never forgot what they were commanded to do in the mission of the church. So they were uh, obviously weakened in their attempt or in their messaging. So they asked God for boldness, right? They wanted holy boldness, as the saints of, uh, of yesterday would say to us. Uh, they wanted to be able to do this this message without fear. And why is that relevant today? Because many of us are ashamed. Many of us are quiet Christians. Many of us are Sunday Christians. Many of us uh, uh, don't want the message to go out uh, beyond uh, safe borders, if you will. We don't want to put ourselves out there. But these individuals are laying everything on the line and so uh, 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 the prayer went out that the law would take notice of the threats that had been made against them uh, uh, and then the response to the threats was that they would respond with boldness to the threats you know when the enemy doesn't want you to do something how do you respond to that uh, do you say yeah okay I won't preach anymore yeah I won't witness anymore these individuals came to a place of confrontation uh, 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 with these leaders with these uh, 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 individuals who wanted them to stop preaching and they believed that they needed more boldness so they can continue to do it uh, they didn't ask God to kill their enemies they asked God to look on it Take notice of it and grant us what we need to keep doing what you have commanded us to do. Followed by the uh, uh, the preaching of the message, verse 30, I'm in Acts chapter 4, by stretching out your hand to heal that the, the signs and wonders may be done. This is key here in this prayer through the name of your Holy son Jesus I think if we had a little bit of time we could really pull this apart because many of us are trying to get our prayers heard uh, but we don't know how to get our prayers heard because we don't know as James say we ask uh, we don't receive when we ask because we ask with selfish motives here they are not asking that they get the glory out of what is done as a result of receiving God's hand or help in this matter they wanted the glory to go through the name of Jesus they wanted the glory to be uh, uh, attributed to the one who's worthy of it and that's very important so whatever God does this prayer request goes out is that God gets the glory and that it goes to Jesus we just want to be bold we just want to preach and 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 however you heal through signs and wonders whatever you do God it'll be through the name of your holy servant Jesus God heard that prayer God recognized that this was in line with his will uh, 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 if you go back to Acts chapter 1 and you know but prior to the ascension Jesus is commanding his disciples he's giving them the platform and the 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 marching orders if you will of the strategy or the goal of what he wants them to do and so if we want God to respond to our prayers I'm trying to help somebody here we need to align ourselves with what God wants to do what he originally told us to do it was never designed for the church to function of its own accord according to what it thinks and what it feels like doing or what it wonders about it was designed for the church to function through the name of Jesus via the power of the Holy Ghost and so uh, we really can't do church without spirit right we can do the the practical we can assemble and we can do all the other things that we that we love and we that we uh, uh, traditionally do but without the Spirit of God we cannot have quote unquote church we cannot enjoy fellowship uh, uh, with God without him being involved and so uh, it's important that we pray in concert with the will of God now once we know if we can trace all of this uh, uh, prayer request back to what Jesus originally commanded and so they are praying right in line and so now we get to a place where all the believers 
in verse 32 have this in mind uh, no one claimed anything uh, of their own and so now it, it, it looks practical now when the spiritual is in place and so when the spiritual is not in place we can't do what is righteous to do practically I hope this is making sense to you today but let's start with God and let's end with God if I can use that uh, a phrase with you today so with great power the apostles uh, after they got the prayers answered they continued they were faithful to to do what they asked God to give them so they could do or continue to do and so in in like fashion they continue to do what the Lord told them to do and then in verse 33 it says and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them this is where you have unity how do we define unity without God how do we have unity without being on the same page in terms of doctrinal matters and our messaging how can we be uh, uh, effective and, and, and be unified without having the same boldness about what we need to do and how can be how can we be unified if we're not all praying about and for the same things sometimes I know you have seen a, a prayer circle uh, and certainly we uh, perhaps have been involved in those but what if all of those individuals that are linking hands uh, uh, to create this prayer circle what if there is a weak link what if there is a link that is not on uh, uh, the same page with the other individual hand that they're holding what if uh, uh, the other links in the chain are, sp are praying for spiritual things for God to get the glory but there are some in the circle who want natural things and so uh, we never uh, we never ask right we don't check we don't have a quote unquote prerequisite uh, for the prayer circle but it's, it's important that we understand the first century church and the model that they are laying out for us even when they got in trouble, even when uh, 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 Peter and John were arrested uh, uh, and they were threatened not to preach the name of Jesus anymore or else, right? But, but they decided that everything uh, it, it revolves ab around what we have been commanded to do and we're going to do what the Lord say do, right? And let the chips fall where they may. So we can see from this account, because God had blessed them through this prayer, uh, according to his will, that they were in sync. They were in sync with the message. God was in sync about the commandment. And those things came together to produce such grace so powerfully at work in them all uh, that, that nobody needed for anything. And so this doesn't, you know, I know we like to run to the money and to the stuff, and that's fine. But we're going to show you a little bit later uh, in this second outline here that it's good to be a good steward over what you have practically or through material things. But we have to be good stewards of the truth, the message that we have received. And we find this uh, uh, in Peter and James and, and the chief priests and the elders that, that caused them to come together. They were good students or stewards over what God told them to do. And and it's you know, it's not too late for any of us to go back to first base, uh, go back to home plate, uh, and see what the Lord originally told us to do. And if we would follow that, I'm talking to me now as well, as if, if we would respond to the things that God have given us to do originally. Uh, uh, and, and you might wonder where I'm going with this, but, but these are believers, right? These are the people of God. These are the, the, the disciples. These are the followers. These are the students. These are the people that uh, since day one, since Jesus uh, 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 selected them one by one and name by name that they have followed along with him long enough to determine that their life is not their own they have come to understand that 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 their will has to be merged in with God's will in order for life 
to work, in order for things to function, in order for us to enjoy unity, something has to come together. You and I must come together with the will of God. And for those of you that are not saved, but you are, are, are practicing as you are saved, then we need to understand that it's going to be difficult for you, uh, even impossible to get where you want with God until you align yourself with the message, with the prayers, then that you might be bold, that the unity might come. Uh, uh, and so we can gather all the people together that we want, but if we don't have unity in the spirit, it doesn't matter how many people we pack into a building. Let's understand that. So uh, 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 the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 32 through 37 provides another view of the pattern of life characterizing the early church and the practice of communal sharing. This is not an event right that, that that we can isolate this is this is their the pattern of life this is how we have to live life connected to the will of God and I think one of the things that we misunderstand about life we we think it's ours uh, we think we can do with it what we want to do with it and you know uh, I, I mean, once we and even before we turn a three times seven, no one can tell us anything. We are ready to do with life what we will. But that is not why we were created. We were created as and for the praise, the glory and the honor of God. Genesis will lay that out for us. Right. It was not about uh, 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 Adam and Eve. Uh, doing their thing it was about them being caretakers for God's possessions right so I think we understand that now we want to contrast this to our second outline uh, about counterfeit sharing uh, and but the question is asked how can believers be encouraged to give generously on a regular basis so if we're going to give then let's understand what we should be giving first. Is it our money? Is it our possessions? Or is it you? I would encourage you to read Romans chapter 12 uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Don't try to buy God. Give God what is due Him, which is your life. And when you give God a life, He will give you of His Spirit. And his spirit will dictate to our hearts and minds how we should be good stewards, not just over our possessions, but over our time, uh, uh, over our prayer life, and the and, and, and everything associated with that. I want I want you to understand that God wants to be involved with everything, every aspect of our lives. It's not just about uh, the things that we give God, because keep in mind Psalm 24 will help us to understand that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. So you're not giving God anything that he does not already own. But Acts chapter 5, we move here to a different account, still talking about the early church. And then again, I want to read this from the NIV translation. This is Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira, you all have seen this story many many times, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. Keep that in mind. Underline that if you can because we're going to talk about being a steward of what you know being a, a good steward of what you know and what you understand and being accountable for that, those things. Uh, we're going to talk about that. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive from the land. So this, here, Peter being used by the same Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit, is now speaking not just to Ananias, but the Spirit that is using Ananias. He calls it out, right, uh, 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 by name, and he knows exactly 
what has happened not because he's psychic because the spirit of God is using him to uh, indict this situation and we always have to keep in mind and I know we 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 historically we like to say amen to a particular message we like to and preachers like to hear us say amen uh, and it, it it sends a message to the preacher that we agree or that we understand but let's un, let's unpack this God knows what you understand God knows what you have heard and God is holding us accountable for those amens for those things that we say we have uh, heard and that we understood because now we are expected and responsible for being good stewards of a message it's not just what we hear you have you have to do something with it but here Peter is dealing with it verse 4 he asks he's still dealing with An uh, uh, Ananias didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold wasn't the money at your disposal what made you think of doing such a thing you have not uh, lied just to human beings but to God right do we understand that the Spirit of God is using these apostles we learned early on as we read uh, to you these are the acts of the Holy Spirit these are not quote unquote the acts of the apostles none of us hear me clearly can do anything on our own accord John I believe chapter 15 verse 6 Jesus says apart from me you can do nothing but with the Spirit of God working uh, the, the, the Saints of old used to talk about us being unction we didn't do anything unless we were unction uh, by the Holy Spirit we didn't move unless we moved according to the dictation of the Holy Spirit you don't hear those terms uh, 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 so much so now but verse 5 we're still in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias heard this he fell down and he died right and great fear seized all who heard what had happened we don't like to talk about this uh, divine punishment divine judgment this is uh, uh, by all accounts uh, he is a believer right uh, but God moves harshly on those who are stewards of understanding. I think James talks about this that not many should teach because we're going to be held as a high, at, at a higher standard. You are and I am responsible uh, for what we understand. I remember some years ago I was praying to God uh, about a particular matter but I kept saying to God I don't know I don't know I don't know I said that for quite a few times and the Spirit of God uh, became agitated uh, with that statement and he said stop saying that you don't know you do know right and so for years I haven't used that <laughs> I don't I don't use that uh, term with God particularly about things that I understand because the Spirit of God uh, 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 and even Jesus in this account here if we go back over uh, to Acts and, and, and even before he taught these guys right uh, the disciples the messages have gone out clearly uh, if they if they have all things in, in common as we have read means they were on the same page with the message they were on the same page with the boldness they were on the same page with the prayer so now here we have a contrast to our earlier uh, outline where here's somebody putting God to the test right trying to overstep what they know to be true or uh, the truth if you will as we talked about in our uh, lesson topic as I s said to you early stick a pin in that because that's where it is uh, and so you cannot fool me about what you don't understand I mean yes you can uh, uh, but you cannot fool God right and and so the reason why that Ananias is being uh, 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 judged here by the Spirit of God is because God is moving and moved on him in a place where he knew he knew better right we we read it earlier in verse 2 that his wife 
with his wife's full knowledge. We haven't gotten to her yet. Still dealing with him. But now he's lost his physical life. And we need to understand, and I don't want us to, to miss this because I'm going to give you some scripture to tie all of this together because uh, Peter is not the only one that have talked about this type of uh, divine uh, judgment, if you will. And so he died, and then fear, obviously, it shook everybody else that, that heard what happened. Verse 6, then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Verse 7, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Verse 8, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Why is that relevant? Sometimes <laughs> we think that God doesn't know the answer to the question, but he always knows the answer so in verse 9, Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? So now we're dealing with people who have uh, uh, knew better, right? They knew the Word of God. They knew the message much better. They had the same Spirit. And, 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 and I want us to understand this kind of thing happens to all of us. Uh, uh, grace has just kept us right we've all overstepped uh, we have not been forthright with God in our confession uh, let's just set the table that we don't isolate Ananias and Sapphira that they're the only ones in history that have committed such an affront to the grace of God we all have sinned and let's do it biblically and have come short we all have lied at some point in time uh, uh, to the Spirit of God uh, to the people of God we haven't fully confessed things that we've done and, and so we thought God didn't see us when we went over there and we turned the lights off but God saw everything in the dark as it as if it was done in the light but these individuals conspired they set this thing up they had no intentions even though it was their property even though as as peter said it was yours you could have did whatever you wanted to do with it you didn't even have to engage in this but that you engaged in it and then you set it up that you wasn't going to be forthright about it then that's why god is upset that's why the spirit of god is angry and that's why the spirit of god has moved on uh, uh, on these two individuals so as to cut their physical life short. I want us to get this clearly. Their physical life got cut short, right? We're going to talk about that. He's still asking her, why did you do this? He said, listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Verse 10, at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Verse 11, then great fear seized the whole church, right? And all who heard about these events. Let's talk about first Sunday. Every first Sunday, historically, we have commune together we have taken the Lord's Supper right and we have most pastors uh, historically will read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and it will go down through that passage of Paul uh, recounting these things at uh, uh, the Last Supper if you will or the, uh, um, the this Advent uh, uh, if you will this, this uh, sacrament uh, that let a man examine himself, right? And I said to you earlier, we can all thank God for the abundance of grace and mercy. And though we didn't come to this part as Ananias and Sapphira, but we've been here, right? We've been here time and time again. And the grace of God, even as believers, let's, let's, let's understand this. We've come to this place time and time again where we have put God to the test. And we didn't always repent. I believe if they had done that, then they would have been 
they would have been fine if they had confessed it. But a conspiracy doesn't work like that. Deceit doesn't work like that. It works under the shadow. It works under the framework of I'm going to do this thing and nobody is going to know anything about it. Don't you know God sees everything that we do? I've had over the years, I was getting ready to do wrong, right? And God spoke to my thought. I didn't do anything. I hadn't got to that part. <laughs> but he spoke to the thought, right? He changed the course. And God has done this with many of us, with all of us from time to time. God has changed the course of your thought, of your temptation, of your uh, thinking that it'll be just one time that I do this, right? I, I, I'll, I'll do it and, I, I, and I, I, I'll do it once and I'll quit. And God has intervened. And who's to say that when God intervened that he didn't spare your life? Right? I'm not talking about you as a sinner. I'm talking about you as a believer. Right? Because none of us, right? If you go back over into Genesis chapter 3, it'll say this about Satan that he is more crafty than any other created thing. And I know we pat one another on the back because we're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Nothing wrong with that. But let's understand this. Satan is not impressed. It will not stop him from tempting you. It will not stop him from enticing you. If he did it to the, to the Son of Man, to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, what makes you different, right? So thank God each time, right? that we didn't fall to this kind of indictment. But as promised, I want to give you these scriptures. Ananias and Sapphira's sin. Let's talk about that like Samson and Saul. Ananias and Sapphira, they sin the sin that leads to physical death. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. The first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 16 and I also want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 30 so it was a direct yielding to Satan in the sense of lying to the Holy Spirit and tempting him who was operating in such fullness of power in giving witness of the power of the crucified and risen Christ to the entire Jewish nation. So Peter was prominent in the discipline meted out. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 and also Matthew chapter 18 verse 18. So this kind of sin, right, is something that even as as a believer is critical that we do what the Lord tell us to do because it's, it's, it's very easy for us to lose our physical lives it doesn't say here that these individuals were lost right uh, that they were not saved but their lives got cut short right as a form of discipline and there were at least two times in here where we read about in this account that others were affected. Fear, if you will, uh, came, uh, as verse 11 said, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So what would that do for the church at large? How would that shape the conduct and the character of the entire church? How would that shape the character and the conduct of believers, right? And so we need to conclude that this was two lessons, a husband and wife, right? That God disciplined them in a manner 
that everybody knew about it that the church could be the whole thing would not be affected right and so this is God being justified and it, as you read further on in this account uh, throughout the book of Acts uh, particularly in verse 12 this is not a part of our text but I want to share it with you as I seek to close Acts chapter 5 verse 12 let's just continue that thread out after these two individuals were taken um, short lives cut short and through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch yet none of the rest dared join them but the people esteemed them highly look at verse 14 and believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by night might fall passing by might fall on some of them verse 16 also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed I want us to understand today that God is still working he continues to work through us in spite of our shortcomings I want you to cling to the hope of this message and I want you to understand as a believer that it's very important that we make peace with God right so we can enjoy the peace of God without making peace with God you will not enjoy the peace of God that passeth all understanding so it's very important that we uh, if we have fallen down as a believer I'm still talking to you then I want you to get up if you have committed any sins as a believer the greatest gift that God has given to us as a body of people as a church is to be able to repent some of you might be saying, well, I haven't done anything. Well, I want you to read the first epistle of John, chapter 1. Just hang out over there. Because all of us have fallen into this category at some point in time. We didn't stay there, but we've seen it. We've been there where we didn't do what God told us to do. We didn't handle the word of God in the way that we understood it. Right? But the grace of God overlooked that situation and you know what God did about it he woke you up again this morning clothed in your right mind gave you the actions of your limbs even a reasonable portion of health and strength and allowed the blood to continue to run warm in your veins Reverend why did he do that so we'd have an opportunity to come to ourselves and once we come to ourselves, we come to him and say, Lord, I have done this thing. I believe if Ananias and Sapphira had done that, they would continue, they would have continued to grow in the knowledge of the truth. They would have continued to be flanked with the uh, like believers as themselves. And they, they could have grown in spirit. Maybe even in things, maybe even in healing, maybe even in possessions. We don't know now because their lives were cut short. Just because they did not want to confront God and own the thing that they did. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen and for what our ears have heard. We thank you for this message. Father, we pray that you are pleased. We pray that you have used me in such a way that it has impacted somebody's thought process, somebody's life, even my own. 
But most of all, Father, I thank you for forgiving us. The cross comes to mind. The blood that Jesus shed at Calvary comes to mind. The fact that he was beaten, that he was crucified, that he was spat upon, that a crown of thorns was placed upon his head, nails in his hands and feet, and he died. But on the third day, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands, and that power I pray this day that you would bestow upon us, Father, not for our glory, not for our honor, and not for even that we might be praised by others, but that you might get the glory out of your anointing and your spirit, that we might be able to go forward in a way, not as individuals, but as brothers and sisters in Christ, even as a church, even as the body of Christ, that we might be the kind of witnesses that the early church prove to be examples and a pattern that we might follow. Father, and as we move throughout this Thanksgiving and this uh, Christmas season, we realize that there are many who have lost their lives to this virus. Many families have been affected by other conditions. We just ask, as we read tonight, that you laid your hands on many individuals and they were healed. Many sick people were brought before you and you did the work and you healed. And I believe you're still doing that today. And I believe you will still heal today. That you are no shorter than your word. We follow this pattern as well. Not only as the believers grew, but we know that you continue to work. And we believe that is the case this day. So we pray for those who are on the front lines. We pray for those who have uh, been given power and rank to to initiate policy we pray for those families now and wherever they might be for whatever they may lack that you might supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory and always father if there's somebody that's not saved we pray that you would save them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet not for their own glory not for selfish reasons, but that they might give you the glory, not just one day, but as David has said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask these petitions and lay them at your feet. Amen. So again, until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.